Meeting will come to order. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, the assembly today is uh, honoring uh, various uh, survivors and family members uh, in honor of Holocaust Awareness Month. And uh, the assembly floor session has just recently adjourned. So we want to thank uh, those um, survivors and family members who came today. Um, we now want to get underway with our regular business today. Welcome to the assembly budget subcommittee. Number one on health and human services. Uh, we will start with um, a presentation on emergency medical services authority. I'd like to invite our panelists to come up. Um, Howard Backer from the Emergency Medical Services Authority, Dan Smiley. Uh, we'll also have representatives from finance and from the legislative analyst's office. Um, we have a number of uh, other hearings taking place at the same time, so our members will be moving in and out of the committee. Um, if you haven't been present, I'll just share with you what we always ask our presenters to give us the kind of high-level overview, save time for questions so that we can have healthy discussion. Uh, with that, um, we will turn it over, uh, Mr. Backer, uh, whenever you are ready. Chair Thurman and uh, staffers, my name is Dr. Howard Backer, and I'm the director of the Emergency Medical Services Authority, which I'll refer to as the EMS Authority, and this is Dan Smiley, our chief deputy director. As requested, I'll provide a brief overview of the department, our budget, and our current budget proposals. Our EMS system in California was created in 1981 by Health and Safety Code Division 2.5 with the intent of creating a statewide system with the EMS authority responsible for, quote, coordination and integration of all state activities concerning emergency medical services to ensure the provision of effective and efficient emergency medical care. Emergency medical services are broadly defined as the services utilized in responding to a medical emergency. EMS is a small department with a large mission, and our responsibilities fall into three major categories. First, pre-hospital emergency services, which are one piece of an emergency care network integrated with hospital emergency departments and other services that together provide one of our major health care safety nets. Pre-hospital 911 services in particular are widely seen by the public as a guaranteed medical service that's coordinated by local government. In California, there are 60,000 certified EMTs and 20,000 licensed paramedics that respond to about 4 million 911 calls for emergency service annually using 3,600 ground ambulances and 50 air ambulances. And they generally take the ill or injured to one of 310 acute care emergency uh, departments, which may be one of the designated specialty centers like a trauma center. Specifically, the EMS uh, authority is responsible for scope of practice, training standards and regulations for EMT and paramedic practice, and first aid that's provided by public safety personnel. We license paramedics and discipline those licenses. We also oversee public first aid standards, training and regulations related to licensed child care providers, specific areas such as epinephrine, naloxone, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and automated external defibrillators. We're currently in the process of implementing recent legislation by including naloxone in the scope of practice for EMTs, supporting its use by public safety personnel, and we're developing training and certification for the public to use epinephrine auto-injectors. One new initiative that we have involves an approved health workforce pilot project through the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development to test and evaluate the use of paramedics in expanded mobile health care roles to fill some of the gaps in local health care systems and improve access to care and integration to care. Secondly, we developed guidelines and approved plans for emergency medical services implemented by the local EMS agencies, of which there are 33, 26 are single county agencies and seven multi-county. Our direct 911 ambulance service is provided by public fire agencies and private providers, including volunteers in some uh, areas, rural areas. In this role, the EMS Authority provides operational quality parameters for local EMS agencies and the provider agencies and develops regulations for specialty care systems, including the trauma system, poison control, pediatric emergency care, stroke centers, and cardiac centers. Through one current initiative, the EMS Authority is encouraging providers and agencies to conform with medical standards of documenting patient care in electronic records that can be aggregated, analyzed, and used for system evaluation and performance improvement, and eventually integrated into electronic medical records. Um, 
Through Health Information Exchange, we're working to exchange clinical data with hospitals to improve pre-hospital care and care during a disaster when patients are treated outside their usual medical system. And our third major area of responsibility is the medical response to disaster. The Health and Safety Code states that in cooperation with the Office of Emergency Services, the authority shall respond to any medical disaster by mobilizing and coordinating emergency medical services mutual aid resources to mitigate health problems. So we work with local, state, and federal partners to plan for the medical impact of disasters and major events ranging from earthquakes to air crashes and pandemics to heat wave. We partner with the Department of Public Health in this emergency function, and we spent the last several years building a public health and medical response infrastructure across state and local partners. At the core of our preparedness is a staff trained in both emergency management and specific response plans. Planning is essential for how we respond and how we'll interface with our partners. Um, although the necessary, though, plans are not sufficient unless they're tested and trained through exercises. Uh, we have previously discussed EMSA's tiered response to disasters to provide emergency medical response in the field. Our first tier is 41 ambulance strike teams that are housed in local jurisdictions that can establish field triage, treatment, and staging site for multi-casualty incidences within hours. These are routinely used by our local jurisdictions for multi-casualty events or for hospital evacuation. The second tier are Met California medical assistance teams comprised of about 40 members that can deploy within 12 hours and treat patients in any location. And these are one of our most fle flexible direct patient care assets because they can be deployed as a healthcare team of any size, can take on health missions ranging from acute emergency care to management of evacuated long-term care facilities, and they come fully equipped to act as an independent team in existing uh, facility or even in a tent shelter. We also have disaster health care volunteer registry that contains about 21,000 licensed personnel of all types, including locally organized medical reserve corps. And the third tier is our mobile field hospital program, which is currently very limited and has seen no significant change since last year. These can serve to replace or supplement a general acute care hospital following a large-scale disaster. But the EMS authority no longer has funding to maintain our mobile field hospital assets. And so one hospital has been maintained with the ability to deploy within three to seven days, while the other two are stored without equipment maintenance and would require several weeks to deploy. And efforts to find a public or private partner to fill our funding gap have not been successful. The supplemental budget report that you re recently received provides more detail on the status of our preparedness assets and resources and some additional context for our budget change proposal. The state of our preparedness and the level of preparedness to be maintained is an issue that we've been discussing actively within the administration, and we welcome engagement of the legislature in this discussion. The current BCP is a means to stabilize our preparedness that's been diminished by budget and grant reductions. The governor's proposed budget for 2015-16 includes budget authority in the amount of 32.2 million and 71 permanent positions. Of this amount, 43% is delegated for state operations and the remainder is delegated to local assistance. Um, our workload adjustments and policy adjustments under consideration include the following items. We're requesting a special fund budget authority augmentation of $366,000 and one permanent full-time office technician. These funds are from the EMS personnel fund generated by paramedic licensing fees. The additional budget authority and new position would be utilized to address increased workload associated with converting approximately 44,000 license and enforcement documents to digital files. And then operational efficiencies would be achieved once all existing paper files are successively scanned by the document in imaging system. The paramedic licensor unit would then be able to decrease paramedic application processing time, provide same-day services to walk-in applications, and improve other personnel functions. And secondly, the EMS Authority is requesting a general fund augmentation of $500,000 and two permanent positions to stabilize disaster medical preparedness resources in order to competently respond to a moderate incident and initiate response to a catastrophic incident. The additional funding and new positions being requested will be utilized to reestablish a Southern California 
um, California medical assistance team and support existing disaster medical preparedness programs like our ambulance strike team program and the Northern California CalMAP program. In addition, the new positions will coordinate joint activities with the California Department of Public Health Emergency Preparedness Office, including cast catastrophic event planning, emergency operations center planning and development, and the training and exercise program. I will stop there and be available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, any questions from committee members? I, I'd like to just ask you about the disaster preparedness aspect of this. I got to be honest, as I read it, I thought this is a disaster. If we have three mobile hospitals and two of them are not in service, I thought, what in the world are we going to do, right? We live in the state where we know we have some of the greatest likelihood for disaster, certainly from earthquake and other natural disaster. But I just thought, what in the world are we going to do if, as you said, um, it would take weeks to mobilize one of those mobile hospitals. What would happen if, for those who are suffering major illness or Ill injury during the time of one of these disasters if we have to wait weeks to mobilize um, one of these mobile hospital units? Well, we would not have the physical structure to replace an acute care uh, hospital, uh, but we would have, uh, thanks to this BCP and our federal partners, we would have medical teams that could come out and set up in other locations in much smaller uh, tent shelters or in existing facilities to provide medical care. Um, but we would, we would not have read, uh, rapid access to those assets that were purchased back in 2006. I'm going to push back a little bit on that answer because while you answered my question, it did not give me any greater comfort that we are prepared to be able to handle medical emergencies during any disaster. And I understand that the budget change proposal would give a few more staff. Um, but without the right kinds of resources. And I'm just being honest, I don't see any treatment in this budget um, from the department, from the governor, from anyone on enhancing what has been cut as a result of the recession. I get it. But we know that there is a price to pay for not taking action. And I'm asking now, now that we're face to face, what is the plan for taking that action? The plan at this point has been to work for uh, more federal resources because we have been looking for years for partners for, to fill our funding gap to keep the hospitals in, in uh, ready condition. Um, and, but unfortunately, they can't be kept ready without uh, some funding. So we, we would rely on the concept of mutual aid, which is pulling resources from around the state and pulling resources from our federal partners. Um, these are, you know, substantial assets uh, and, uh, you know, but we're at a make or break point with those. So I get it that the mobile units are very expensive. Tell me that there is a comparable way to manage. I, I guess I still don't have confidence that we're ready for a disaster. I, I've, I read in the report that there was not sufficient data to compare the state of California's preparedness to other states, and I just thought, how much data do we need? I mean, California is very unique in the challenges that we face every single day, right? We teach school children to how to prepare for natural disaster, right? We tell them what they need, but yet we in the state are not prepared. That's the sense I'm getting, even now, I'm being honest. Even hearing you say, I get the funding capability, I totally get that. What I don't get is what is the plan for really being prepared um, and to not have to hope that mutual aid will be able to fill the gap. The impression that I just got, I'm just being honest, was one that we're not sure. And I don't like uncertainty, especially in the face of disaster. I, I, it makes me nervous. I'll be honest. I read this and I thought about vulnerability um, for my family for the communities, for people with disabilities, or people who might be injured as a result of the disaster. And I'm sitting here sweating bullets now, thinking about even more vulnerability. So I'm pushing back. We got to do better. What else can we do? 
Well, I, we did give you some comparisons of some other big states, and there's a wide variation between states that actually have a lot of physical assets and states that don't maintain their own physical assets. Um, the, the base for preparedness is knowledgeable staff and plans and exercising those. So I think that's the, that's the foundation for any level of preparedness. Assets are layered on top of that. And we were very fortunate, you know, to get some assets. Um, but the, the question now is the state's interest or willingness to maintain assets because they don't come, to, they, they, they are expensive even to maintain, much less expensive than buying them. Um, most states in the United States do rely on mutual aid from either other states or the federal government. But there's an inherent risk in that there's a delay in bringing in mutual aid assets from other parts of the country or across the country. So um, I share, you know, we, we, you can never be, you're always building on your preparedness um, and you can never be there, um, so to speak, because there's always something can, that can exceed your, your capability. What percentage of preparation would you rate our current system, resources, people, what percentage of preparation would you say that we stand at? Where, where we have targeted is to try to say, okay, we will be prepared for a moderate level event. And a moderate level event would be a, um, uh, say, a Northridge st level earthquake or a H1N1 pandemic. We would class as moderate events. What level earthquake did you say? Northridge. Okay. Um, you know, as opposed to a catastrophic event, which would be, you know, a seven point eight, uh, we, we've done the catastrophic planning for a 7.8 earthquake in Southern California, a 7.6 here on the, um, you know, or above on in, in the Bay Area. So those are catastrophic level events or a large scale, say an anthrax attack or major pandemic that was highly um, contagious. Those are, those are considered catastrophic level events. Um, so our goal, uh, you know, where I think we are is in, in, in good shape to respond to a moderate level event, but for a catastrophic event, we can initiate some response, but there's, uh, we would be heavily dependent on ex external resources. So this is our first time meeting together, so I'm going to give you a grade of unacceptable, but I'm going to give you a chance at a redo. I want you to come back. I want you to tell us what our comparative alternative plans are, given the fact that we don't have the dollars for the mobile unit fully. And I want to know other plans that can be put in place to increase our chances of preparation for a serious situation. I am hopeful that we never have to have this conversation outside of the abstract. But I believe in preparation. And I believe that you want to be prepared but I think it's fair to say that we're just not prepared. And I don't want us to have to find out the hard way how long mutual aid is going to take. So my answer today is unacceptable. We're not prepared. Let us get prepared. Come back and share with us plans for how we will be better prepared, what our percentage of vulnerability is, where our holes are. And you mentioned that there are ongoing conversations um, in your department and with the governor about how to prepare or how to enhance given the recession. I want you to come back, and I want you to tell us where you are, and I want you to tell us how we can be helpful. You said you want to engage the legislature. We also want to, in this committee, we'll push back, we'll ask tough questions, but we'll also say how can we help. So that's my offer to you, is that we're willing to work with you. If you want to engage the legislature, uh, I am happy to be uh, among those who raises this issue with the rest of the legislature, but I need to have more details from you. What say you, sir? Um, yes, sir. Thank you. I'm happy, like I say, I'm happy to engage in the conversation, um, and it's it's not it's difficult to pin down, but um, we can certainly um, discuss it and try and get information that would be helpful to reassure all of us that we are on the road to preparedness. I can give you a mark for progress for your openness, <laughs> because none of us can be perfect, right? We can't. We don't know how it will go but we have to know that we have our best foot forward in terms of our resources. So we're looking forward to our work together to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there are any other committee members have any questions. Uh, seeing uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll?